Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to episode 16 of Cracking the Code. I'm joined here by Chris Bowen, our CISO, and by Jim Desharm, our CTO. And we're here to talk about uh, CRAs, um, what they are, why they're important, and what value they bring to our different customers. So I'm going to remove myself from the camera, and I'm going to let Chris and Jim um, have an engaging conversation. We'll see how engaging it is, Natalie. Thanks for teeing that up for us. I'm Chris Bowen. I am... Uh... I'm our CISO, our founder, and I'm excited today to have Jim here with me. Jim has uh, recently been added to the roster of uh, Clear Data Leadership. I think it's almost a year. I'm, I'm thinking I'm eight months or so, Jim. But already Jim has done some wonderful work on our platform, help it, helped it advance. One of the things that we want to talk about today is... The fundamental part of a cloud offering, a cloud service, is making sure that you're using a service in a way that complies with HIPAA, uh, in a way that protects your data, and in a way that allows you to, to have speed of execution on the development side or from our customer side. So Jim, uh, you came in, you saw the CRA, you saw it for the first time, you said, what the heck is this? Uh, give me your first impression of what it was, and then I'll kind of give you a little history on some of that. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and uh, uh, great to join you here. So, yeah, when I first came in, uh, you know, as CTO, um, looking at the technology that we had in place, the CRAs were definitely a very interesting part of the recipe for clear data success with our customers and helping our customers remain secure and compliant. And in that, that you know, look, there's a lot of tools out there that will analyze your environment and, and look at vulnerabilities, look at misconfigurations. Um, but CRAs were, I thought were a great sort of building blocks to help customers get off, get started on the right foot uh, of, of how they approach uh, uh, deploying things in the cloud, whether they're, whether they're deploying to the cloud for the first time, whether they're deploying new workloads. Um, but it really was a wonderful, as they're called, reference architecture for, okay, how do I use this? And the biggest thing I liked about it was, I mean, my first, I'm like, well, wait a minute, don't the cloud providers provide you the instructions for how to use these? Um, and of course they do. But what the CRAs I thought were great at is, wait a minute, as a healthcare organization, what do I need to know about deploying these services uh, in my cloud environment, uh, especially given the requirements of being, uh, you know, HIPAA compliant, high trust compliant, et cetera. So, so I thought it was a great building block, not just not just finding what I did wrong, but giving me the foundation to build cloud services the right way. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jim. It was we started doing CRAs, I think, back in 2014, a long time ago in the company. And what we tried to do at the time, just to give a little bit of history, was we tried to keep up with the cloud providers and say, hey, let's let's make sure that what we're doing is we're to your point, what you just said. We're taking the, the instructions from the cloud provider, but we're all, we're making it more specific uh, to healthcare, and we're making it specific to those frameworks that we have to comply with: security rule, breach notification rule, all those kinds of things. And what we found out was we couldn't keep up, and uh, and so what we've started to do is work with our product team, uh, Jim, your team, to make sure that we uh, create the ones create the CRAs that our customers are really demanding in some cases. And in other cases, for example, with AI, we know we've got to be ahead of it uh, and do it in advance of what the, the cloud providers might do. So a couple of those examples include Bedrock and Falcon 40B on AWS and OpenAI with, uh, with Azure. Uh, and, and our customers have really taken advantage of some of those, those CRAs. You recently worked with Machinify, one of our customers, on an AI deployment, how did the CRA help with that? Effort? Yeah, yeah. See, that was very interesting. So, you know, look, a lot of people, just about everybody's looking at at uh, uh, generative AI capabilities and how it supports their business. What was you? What was interesting, and I'm finding more common with companies like Machinify, they were they are an AWS shop. So everything that they've done to date has been AWS. And when they wanted to break into AI, they looked at all, all the three major cloud providers, AWS, Google, Azure, at their AI capabilities. And their determination was that Microsoft Azure's open AI technology was best suited for what they wanted to do. But keep in mind, they're an AWS shop. 
And, and so they needed a little bit more help because, you know, if anybody's, you know, listening has, has done a multi-cloud strategy, you know, all three cloud providers just have a lot of the same stuff, but they all speak a different language. And that's what I tell people, like you're using the same things, but e even to the point of uh, in AWS, you have a, an AWS account, but in Azure, you have a subscription and in Google, you have a project. They're all the same thing, only different. Um, and so even just understanding the different lexicons used by the cloud providers uh, is important. That's number one. But number two, especially for folks as they start to bridge uh, different cloud technologies from different providers, that was important. Uh, so for Machinify's case, they needed this reference architecture to really understand uh, not just, you know, they understood the capabilities of open AI because that's what they researched. But now how do they, again, back to a reference architecture, how do they fit it into their cloud environment? And how do they, you know, in this case, you know, bridge things like identity controls from what they're doing in AWS uh, to now moving over to moving data over into Azure and keeping that one little, I'll say, island of PHI data that may be flowing through the Azure Open AI, how do they keep that secure when that's not what they do every single day? Totally. I think it's funny, Jim. I have that translation table of <laughs> what the am Rosetta I thinking Stone. today? <laughs> the Rosetta Stone, if you will. Yes. One of the things that we've been able to do with the CRA, though, is really make it common across all three clouds from a risk perspective, from a from a, an approach that that embodies things like, um, you know, what are the common risks in the cloud per se? But then we get into the details of the service itself and say, okay, what are the risks associated with the service? And to get a little deeper, sometimes we'll delve into that CRA and say, okay, if I'm using these set of services on Azure and I go ahead and I introduce another service that could potentially uh, destabilize some of those other services that we have in place, you know, we call that an adverse event mm -hmm. and um, in, in the medical world, and we don't like those. So what we, what we try to do is we try to align and understand what those potential risk variables are, what the threats are, um, how to define the misconfiguration. What, what are some of, the, some of the misconfiguration? For example, in Falcon 40B, which is, uh, De deployed on SageMaker and AWS, uh, you know, you're still utilizing S3, you're still utilizing Lambda, even EC2 instances, for example. Yeah. So, you know, how do you misconfigure those that will let me count the ways, if, if you will, <laughs> let me count the ways. So those are the, some of the kinds of things that we try to, to, to take care of. But in the CRA, we also love to align the statutes with a specific service, for example, backup or audit logging or whatever, we have found that our customers really like the fact that that they can cite a reference on the on the CFR Code of Federal Regulations to to a specific service, and that's hard to do. Yep. Well, well, as we were talking about, that's yet another language in this world of healthcare meets cloud, where we talked about the three languages the cloud providers use, but the regulations are yet another language of you know it. Uh, high trust, HIPAA, NIST, ISO, they're not going to talk to you in in Azure speak and AWS speak. They don't they don't care about that stuff. There's a bunch of English words of therefores and their shalls um, that you have to interpret of what does that mean when I go deploy this EC2 instance, this RDS instance, this Azure blob that I'm storing PHI in. Um, and, and that's what I love about the CRAs as well is, you know, there's almost a section in there. There's references, like you said, to what, how does this affect me from a regulatory standpoint perspective? What is the applicability to HIPAA, high trust? Are these services, which, which resources, which services are even high trust eligible, which ones are not? And then, and then why, what are the, what are the, the dip switches I got to flip to ensure that I adhere to that that other language of regulatory compliance. Um, so that that's another piece that I think the CRAs do uh, that that you don't get any place else. Is that okay? Fit this into the context of my regulatory compliance uh, against those against those frameworks. Yeah, and and let's kind of talk about auditors for a second. Uh, if you think about what you're building and what you've built on the Cyber Health platform, you and your team, obviously, it takes a village. And if you look at um, 
the, the regulations and you look at all of the other details in a, in a CRA, uh, one of the things that, that we have to do is we have to really understand where the risks are in terms of, of what's going to be the first thing you want to address in a misconfiguration, for example. One of the things we've done in a risk index in these CRAs is said, we've defined which ones are the high priorities. For example, has, has the OCR ever fined somebody for failing to, to turn on their flow logs in a way that that they missed a week. No, right. there's never never been a fine for that. But you know, you can be damn sure that some of them have been fined millions and millions of dollars for letting data get exfiltrated, for example. So those are those are some of the examples of the of the things that we try to account for in the CRA. Uh, and by the way, these are these are readily available to our customers in the platform that your team works on. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and I think, you know, back to the auditors, it's a, a big part of the benefits of the CRA is the explainability, right? Is having a common yet another language that you can point when the auditors come in and say, show me how you're demonstrating control of your environments and, and being uh, HIPAA eligible. Here's our interpretation of the framework, the HIPAA framework, for example, um, to our uh, our risks that we see in that, to our implementation standards, and to the, uh, I'll introduce the word, safeguards, you know, what technical controls are we putting into place to demonstrate compliance? So even that explainability to the auditor from, here's the, the, the regulatory framework that you're coming in to audit us against, here's our interpretation as provided by clear data and, and our safeguards and, and CRAs, to here are the technical controls that we put into place, and here's, we can demonstrate that we're doing that. You know that that's huge, and that's again, it's it's again the reference architecture for what ClearData is helping our customers do, and and you didn't have to create your own Rosetta Stone, you didn't have to create your own interpretations, you didn't have to define all that, um, and and there's a comfort in knowing that there are hundreds of other customers following the same reference architecture, the same recipe for success, right? And so you know, I think. I think that that commonality, that uh, that guidance is 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 critical, and and I think you know the last mile of what are the technical controls we're doing to demonstrate compliance or um, provide that evidence, I think is is very important as well. Yeah, I think in closing, Jim, I think one of the cool things about the CRA is it's got some real good nuggets in there. It's got actual code you can actually deploy a Terraform template or a CloudFormation template using the code that's already in there. Yes. Uh, you can see the diagrams, the potential use cases for that service or that bundle of services that make up a solution. So it's really exciting. It's exciting to, to show the, the safeguards in the CRAs to help our customers understand what it is. You're surfacing some of that in the cyber health platform as well. And I think that's a, a phenomenal advancement in the in the platform to make some of that stuff transparent. Any closing thoughts, Jim? Yeah, I, you know, I think just to sum it up, you know, our, the platform is sort of uh, making the CRAs available so they're right there. You know, when you when you've introduced a new type of resource, you know, a new type of service from a cloud provider like Machinify with with Azure Open AI, you know, seeing that pop up as we discover the deploy deployment of that service. We can point customers to, by the way, let's make sure you've reviewed the CRA and here are the applicable safeguards. Our platform, the cyber health platform is going to put into place to help protect that service. Um, you know, that's a wonderful topic for another day to talk about what are, what are our safeguards. Um, but the safeguards really are the, 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 the seatbelts that keep you safe and, and, uh, using these new, these new services. Um, and, and the CRAs again, have that link from, the regulatory framework, what are the risks, how do you successfully deploy these, and what safeguards can clear data provide for you to ensure uh, that you're following the recipe appropriately. Uh, and, and it really rounds it all out from a preventative approach uh, to compliance and security with your reference architectures, uh, all the way to, you know, uh, the safeguards, which, which look all the time, you know, a continuous compliance model to ensure that you stay compliant. 
um, especially as we evolve safeguards as the cloud evolves. So uh, a, lot, a lot of good stuff there. Well said, Jim. I would add one more thing, and that is in addition to the seatbelts, there's a few airbags in there as well. So <laughs> absolutely. Thanks, thanks for joining me. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be excited to talk about the next iteration of some of these topics. My pleasure, Chris. Thanks. Thanks, Jim.